Good evening from the News Radio 1120 AM and 93.7 FM KPNW Studios. I'm Bill London, host of the Wake Up Call on that fine radio station every Monday through Friday morning, 6 AM to 9, except for this week when I'm going to be on Christmas vacation. Okay, for full clarity, yes, I am still pissed at Yoko. The other thing is, is that I recorded this on the weekend and sent it to Rick after he asked me to do a story on it and comment on it based on an interview that we did Monday morning on the wake up call that had to do with the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality and the adoption of their climate protection plan. Now, this was done by executive order. Because the governor has been been unable to get the legislature to pass what she wanted, which was essentially an Oregon green plan, or if you will, a cap and trade plan. So because it didn't go through the legislature, she's set out an executive order and told the DEQ to do it instead. And last week, Thursday to be exact, on a four to one vote, they adopted this controversial plan. Now, it requires, among other things, for the DEQ to regulate and reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the state. Now, how you go about really measuring that under this plan is incredibly vague, completely vague. It's based on essentially guesstimates. But it requires fuel suppliers to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the products they sell by 50% by 2035, 90% by 2050, and it's even more aggressive than the, what was passed, at least, than the state's overall goals. And they say that some 13 industrial facilities will also be required to reduce their emissions with aggregate emission reductions targeted at half of today's levels by 2035. And it doesn't prescribe a way for those reductions to even happen. It just says you have to do it. We don't know how you're going to do it, but guess what? You've got to do it. And if suppliers can't meet the reductions, well, they're going to face escalating costs, very large escalating costs, which of course will be indirectly passed through to consumers at the pump in their monthly utility bills and the cost of goods that they buy. The program covers all fossil fuel suppliers, that includes diesel, gasoline, natural gas, and propane used in transportation, residential, commercial, and industrial settings. Bottom line, it is going to force Oregonians to eventually slash their use or significantly pay higher prices. And the rollout starts in early 2022. Let's be honest, this is an unrealistic program, particularly with today's limited availability, for instance, biofuels, electric vehicles, electric trucks, electric large equipment, a lack of charging stations, and alternatives to natural gas. And trade associations for regulated businesses believe that the reductions are completely unachievable, and they warn that a lack of alternative means to comply is going to lead to fuel rationing. They say that the lack of a cost cap is going to lead to steep increases that would undercut their competitiveness, forcing manufacturers to move or cut jobs. And they decry what they describe as well as an 11th hour move by the agency to make the rules more stringent than those that were put before the public for public comment this fall. So in other words, they said last fall, okay, this is what we're going to do. These are what the rules are, comment. So the public commented. Then after they commented, they said, you know what? We're gonna do something completely different with no comment whatsoever. All right, so let's talk about a few of these things. Like for instance, let's talk about natural gas prices. Now, one of the things that has gone completely unreported is what the three, see, that's two, this is three, I can count. What the three natural gas companies in Oregon say is going to be the outcome of this. Now, the Public Utility Commission testified during these public hearings for these rules 
actually laws that are being enacted by non-elected individuals. And here's what they said. There are three natu different natural gas um, providers here in Oregon. There is Avista, there is Cascade Natural Gas, and there is Northwest Natural Gas. Avista and Cascade each provide about 10% of the natural gas provided here in Oregon, with the other 80% of it coming from Northwest Natural Gas. The PUC, during their testifying, would not say which of the utilities gave the individual numbers you're going to hear here, but all three told the Public Utility Commission what they said the likely outcome was going to be. All right. So without naming them, one of those gas producers said that they expected by 2050, the cost increase on industrial bills would be 39%. Another estimated residential cost would increase by 33% by 2040, commercial costs by 40%, so that would be, you know, businesses, but industrial costs, 81%. The third utility estimated residential costs would increase by 70% by 2040, commercial costs by 94%, and industrial costs would more than double at 107%. Now, in particular, there are 800,000 natural gas customers in Oregon. That includes residential, that includes industrial, and that includes commercial. So when you hear 800,000, you think, well, Oregon has a population of more than 4 million. If you think of a residential customer, that's a home. So let's say a home of four people. So you can see this is going to impact millions of Oregonians. Would you like to see your utility rates for natural gas increase 39%, 75%, 33%? And when you talk about the commercial costs, these are businesses. Many businesses, large buildings that contain businesses are heated with natural gas. And the reason for that is because it's cheaper than electricity. And the same goes for major industry. Now, we talk about the increases on, on industry. There was a lot of testimony that went on during these particular hearings. And the DEQ admitted, they admitted in their own testimony that, for instance, a, and I'm going to read from the testimony, and this was written by the DEQ. They said a covered fuel supplier could supply and end up supplying less fuel overall in order to reduce emissions that they are responsible for under the program. In that case, the reduced supply could both increase cost to consumers and businesses and result in what they call opportunity costs to fuel suppliers from lost sales. And they say there may be other costs associated with choosing to comply by directly reducing emissions, such as, for instance, it's going to cost more for equipment, retrofits, supplies, labor, increased administration, and operational impacts. One of the other costs, and they refer to this, although they say they can't really quantify it, is what they refer to as indirect impacts. The DEQ recognizes that as covered entities comply with the program, there will be indirect impacts to customers, consumers, and businesses throughout Oregon these impacts will change. While the DEQ is unable to quantify these indirect impacts, they recognize that compliant costs for fuel suppliers will be passed on and disproportionately impact businesses and industries that face out-of-state competition and are more reliant on natural gas and transportation fuels. Further, disproportionate indirect impacts could also be felt, and this is interesting, by environmental justice communities that have difficulty transitioning 
to clean energy sources and that are less resilient to price impacts. These communities include communities of color, communities experiencing lower incomes, tribal communities, rural communities, coastal communities, communities with limited infrastructure, and other communities traditionally underrepresented in public processes and would be adversely harmed, including seniors, youth, and persons with disability. They further go on to say that it's also going to increase the cost of construction. For instance, they talk about a 1,200 square foot detached single family dwelling on a parcel. The proposed rules, they say, could have an effect on development costs because they could indirectly affect the price of materials used for construction. For example, the indirect impact on the price of materials could occur if covered entities subject to the proposed climate protection plan increase fuel prices and if the companies that manufacture construction materials pass them through increased costs through the price of materials, which of course they're going to do. They have to make a profit, otherwise they close their doors. They say if fuel prices increase, that would increase the cost of operating construction equipment related to the cost of building. Now, one of the industries that is mentioned as going to be heavily regulated is cement. What is cement used for? Construction. One of the things that's not mentioned is asphalt. Now let's think about what is asphalt. Asphalt is black or brown petroleum that has been mixed with a series of other compounds that are used to pave roads. Now there's two types of asphalt. There's man-made asphalt and there's natural asphalt, which is called brea. Brea typically is only used as an additive to what I'll refer to as man-made asphalt, which is made out of the distillation of petroleum products. And what is asphalt used for besides roads? And by the way, I went and checked this, that for the most part, just about all of the millions of miles of roads in the United States are made of asphalt. Some are made of an asphalt concrete uh, concoction, but that only accounts for about 10 to 15 percent, depending on what source you look at, 10 to 15 percent of the roads throughout the United States. And of course, we already know that at least in Oregon, the concrete prices are going to go up. But besides roads, asphalt is used for canals, reservoir linings, dam facings, harbor and sea works, It's also used as a membrane for protection against weathering, mechanical damage. It's also used for riprap, which is crushed rock. It's used for roofs, coatings, floor tilings, soundproofing, waterproofing, and other building construction elements, and in a number of industries, including batteries. Now, One of the other things that is, of course, a part of this is that if you recall, if we talk about asphalt and concrete, you remember House Bill 2017 that passed a few years ago? That basically infused $5.3 billion into the Oregon Department of Transportation for use in bridges and roads. And it was supposed to cover all the work that was needed to be done. If you're increasing the cost of concrete, which is what's used in bridges, and if you're increasing the cost of asphalt, which is going to be used on all of those highways, imagine the increase in cost. And this doesn't even talk about the increase of costs on a local level. If you recall, this was several years ago, Lane County tried to pass what was ballot measure 20-231. It was supposed to raise a million dollars annually so the county could take care of its 1,440 miles of county roads and 417 bridges. Well, it failed. And as a result, 
less work could be done maintaining those bridges, 417 of them, and 1,440 miles of roads. With the increased cost just in asphalt and cement alone, what do you think the likelihood is of those roads being maintained at the current levels? And particularly if you look at some place like, say, Josephine or Jackson counties, where they barely have enough money to keep their jails open, do you really think that work is going to be done? One of the other things is trying to, as part of this new plan by the DEQ under the governor's executive order, would greatly limit natural gas. And we've seen how much the increased costs are going to be there. One of the things that you have to keep in mind is, and it's mentioned throughout, is the electrification of the power grid. So in other words, eliminating natural gas and making more of the power grid and the energy that people use through electricity. Now, the majority of the electricity that we use in Oregon comes from the Bonneville Power Administration. And that is generated through dams. At this same time, the governor of Oregon and Senator Jeff Merkley are pushing to breach dams in the Snake River and the Columbia River. Where is that extra energy going to come from? Normally, I guess, if that was going to be the case, you would have to do it through the generation of electricity through natural gas. Basically, heating water, creating steam, driving turbines, and creating power. But if you're going to eliminate natural gas, how are you going to do that? Alternative measures like, for instance, wind power, thermal power, solar power, it's in its infancy in Oregon. And let's be honest, if the sun's not up, well, you're certainly not going to have much solar power. And if the wind's not blowing, you're not going to get much wind power. And people will say, well, you can store it in batteries. Well, there's only so many batteries and there's only so much you can store it. And those batteries lose power over time and through usage. And if you go through periods where you don't have any wind, how are you going to store all of that electricity known or needed by every Oregonian? Now, one of the things that was suspected is that there was potentially going to be a lawsuit filed over this. And on Friday, I received this. The Oregon Farm Bureau is disappointed in the decision of the Environmental Quality Convention to circumvent the legislature to adopt a cap-and-trade program rule. The so-called Climate Protection Program will devastate Oregon's farmers and ranchers. Why? Raising the costs for fuels, propane, and natural gas that our rural communities rely on to produce food and fiber as part of the global food system. While these rules will have an imperceptible impact on global climate change, the impact on Oregon's rural communities will be real and hard felt. Oregon farmers and ranchers compete in the global marketplace and a decrease in farm viability will only increase global emissions as Oregon transitions our agricultural production to other states. Not only did these rules exceed the agency's authority, they were developed through a rules advisory committee that was hand-selected by the Department of Environmental Quality to allow advocates' voices to dominate the conversation and with time-limited hearings designed to avoid real discussion of the impacts of the rules. Instead, the department modeled scenarios that discounted the real impacts the new programs will have on consumers. The Oregon Farm Bureau will be pursuing a legal challenge to the rules and hopes that voters do not forget this abuse of power when they see their home heating costs and fuel pumps can, uh, prices continue to skyrocket while their income stagnates. Oh, and by the way, according to the DEQ, their estimates, the cost of gas should go up at least 35 cents a gallon at the pumps. This is your Oregon at work. This is your Oregon with decisions 
made by a group of no non lawmakers, non legislators, non elected officials at the governor's command, waving her magic scepter. Let's hope that the Oregon Farm Bureau is successful, because if they're not, let's be honest, you're frickin' screwed. Okay, Rick, now you can get real.